that we have a nation of 4,000 years old on the one hand and has the Bible and the promised land and on the other side you have a nation only born 60 years ago and they are demanding East Jerusalem and half of the what's remained of Israel or of the uh, western part of Palestine. When I say western part of, part of Palestine, I want to go back to the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration stated that Palestine would be a homeland to the Jewish people. That was after Palestine was formed uh, after the First uh, World War, from the was taken from the Ottoman Empire and was formed and was considered the homeland of the Jewish people. This was a promise. This was ratified again in the San Remo Agreement to form the British Mandate over Palestine, and also it was taken in the uh, League of Nations. And today it's also in the UN Charter. When we think about Palestine and what's remained from Palestine, we can see that in 1946, two years before 1948, when Israel was established, the British tore from Palestine a huge territory called the Transjordan, brought in a prince from a Saudi Arabia, Hashemite prince, and made him king. So what was the Palestine, that's the west part from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. And then, in the partition plan, they gave the Arabs half of the territories, but they did not accept it. And the next day, seven armies invaded what was called Palestine of Israel, and they lost. And now they call this loss a Nakba. A Nakba means the disaster. The Arab disaster. We speak about the Nakba, and you can imagine that. And they make also demonstrations on this day. When we uh, celebrate uh, the Day of Independence for Israel, they uh, demonstrate uh, in Nakba, it means uh, their disaster. And what is their disaster? Their disaster is that they could not annihilate the Jewish state. That's their disaster. Because if they would have won the war, then no Jew would have remained in Palestine. But fortunately, we were able to overcome their trust, and the state of Israel was born. And then in 1967, we fought a war of defense. I'm not talking about uh, the Bible and our roots in the Holy Land, but let me talk about international law. According to international law, Jordan occupied the West Bank for 19 years. Egypt occupied Gaza for 19 years. They did not even think about establishing a Palestinian state in the West Bank or in Gaza. It was only Israel who came to the Arabs, to the Palestinians, at their worst position 
when they signed it with Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War, they were thrown out of Kuwait. Arafat was considered a terrorist. He was 3,000 kilometers in Tunisia. And an Israeli government, a leftist government, came over to him and said, we'll make you a king. You will be not more terrorists. We'll give you, we'll give you a state. We'll give you independence. We want only one thing. Make peace. And he said, yes. And he wrote a letter to Yitzhak Rabin, then Prime Minister, and he said, no more war. Every conflict will be solved only by negotiations. And this letter was the basis of the Oslo Agreement. The letter was written on the 15th of September, 1993. It's a date I shall never forget. And after that was the uh, signing of the agreement and the loans of the White House. But he lied. And the, uh, those who brought from Tunisia said that this was only a step towards the annihilation of the state of Israel. You tell me how many nations have overcome a Trojan horse. You know, Troy was destroyed by a Trojan horse. And what we did is we brought all these terrorists from Tunis. We allowed them to have ammunition and guns without any borders. And it only took a few months and people started being blown in buses and cafes and entertainment areas. And uh, it was risky to go from one place to another. You can imagine, I had little children. They used to go to school by bus. And I thought how cruel it is on my part that they go by bus and I have my car because I didn't know, God forbid, that they would come back after school the same day. And you can imagine mothers and fathers, their children going to a, 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 to a pub or to a cafe and then they hear on the radio that the cafe has been blown up and everybody starts looking for his children where they are. A very difficult situation. But even then, there were many people who said that this is the price for peace. They still believe that peace is possible. And when you think of what we've given the Palestinians for the sake of peace, it's incredible. We gave up our most holy places to eternity. Can you imagine Bethlehem, Hebron, Shrem, Shiloh, where the Ten Commandments were, Ephrat, all these places that the Bible we gave it to the Palestinians? We allowed them to rule the temple, the temple mount. All we wanted, only the wailing wall, but for what? We gave them everything. And we got 10,000 rockets from Gaza. And people being killed. And when you see, you say, who is a Palestinian? And what is a Palestinian? You know, most institutions in Palestine before 1948 were Jewish. The Palestine Post 
and other uh, institutions in Israel were all Jewish. And Golda Meir showed that she had a Palestinian passport. If one is born in Palestine, is he Palestinian? There were many Jews born in Palestine. If somebody who has a Palestinian passport, is he Palestinian? So who are those people called Palestinians that now they want a nation? And what makes somebody who lived in a place for 100 years or 200 years make him uh, entitled to nationhood? I was born in Iraq. My family lived there for 2,000 years. Since the destruction of the temple. And all they need is 18 people hanged in the main square of Baghdad for all the Jews to flee. So, what makes them entitled? Statehood. There was no Palestinian before uh, 1948. A Palestinian could be a Jew, could be anybody in Palestine. But you know, we created the Palestinian nation. We were the ones who uh, started recognizing a Palestinian entity. After all, they were all part of the whole Arab world. And if you see the, the speeches of Arab leaders 30 or 40 years ago, they say we are part of the Pan-Arabism. We are not a nation. But when Arafat started the PLO in 1964, that was before 1967, when Israel did not occupy the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. So why did he establish the PLO saying that they want to annihilate Israel? If all they want is a state within the 1967 borderlines. It's because the Arabs will never accept a Jewish state. And some of them say openly that the Jewish state is, is a waqf. A waqf means a holy place that cannot be given. And therefore, no Arab leader can make peace with Israel and giving up Israel within the Green Line. So for the Arabs, there is no difference whatsoever between Shem and Hebron and Bethlehem than Tel Aviv and Haifa and Nathaniel. And when the Arabs speak about the end of occupation, they do not mean the end of occupation in Gaza or the end of occupation in the West Bank. They mean the end of Israel. And we do not trust that yet. Because we are blind for peace. If there is any nation in the world who would give anything for peace, it's the Jewish nation. You know, I served in Gaza as a military officer and a judge of the military court. It was a military court, not of soldiers, it was a military court for uh, terrorists. And at that time, I could walk the streets of Gaza in uniform, without weapon, and I would enter any restaurant and buy food, buy a meal, and they would say thank you. Today, after the peace agreement, after the Oslo agreement, 
If a Jew goes to Gaza, if he were able to go to Gaza, he would be lynched. And you know there were two soldiers who lost their way. And they came to a, a Palestinian post that's not today, that was soon after the 1993 agreement. And they took him to the, they took them. They said, uh, we want to question you. So they took them into Ramallah. And they lynched them. And after they lynched them, they threw them <coughs> from the second floor. And some of those who killed them showed their hands with blood. And a Palestinian woman would say, after her son was suicidal, was uh, made a suicide attack on Jews and was killed, that she would like that all her children would go in the same way. This makes the whole difference between the Jewish people and the Arabs. It's a fantastic difference. You know, when I see blacks of Africa, I cannot tell the difference between one and the other. It's difficult. When Europeans see Jews and Arabs, they can't tell the difference. They think we are very much alike. And they always put the balance. The Jews kill and the Arabs kill. I was once in a lecture in Leipzig University in Germany. And I was asked, why are you killing each other? The same, you are killing each other. So I said, we're not killing each other. They are killing us and we are defending ourselves. And to defend ourselves, we have to kill. And I'll tell you how you know who kills, who attacks, and who is the victim. Ask yourself a question. If the Arabs stop the fighting, will there be peace? The question is yes. If the Jews stop the fighting, will there be peace? No. There won't be peace. Because if the Jews stop the, the defending themselves, the Arabs will continue to attack. And in more force. Therefore, the Jews have no other alternative but to attack back. And I can tell you how difficult it is sometimes to attack a house where a uh, chief terrorist is surrounded by his wives and children. And sometimes, after months of monitoring the place of this terrorist, a plane goes up and he's given an order to come back. Because at that time he had his wife with him or his children with him. But on the other hand, when the Arabs fire on Israel, they make no difference whatsoever. It doesn't matter if it's military or it's civil or it's children or it's old people. And you know the, the time of the uh, Lebanese war, the Hezbollah rocketed all the north part of Israel. And in the north part of Israel, you have many Arabs living. So it so happened that a bomb fell on an Arab house. And the leader of the Hezbollah apologized because he wanted to kill only Jews. By mistake, he killed two Arabs, two children. And the father of these children accepted the apology and blamed Israel for the, uh, the rockets that were fired at his house. 
So you can see the attitudes of the Arab population. Are the two state solution? I don't see two states. I see one state which is racist, Arab, Muslim state, and the leaders of the Palestinians say no Jew will live under a Palestinian state, under the sovereignty of a Palestinian state. This is okay. Arabs can be racist. If a Jewish state would have said, we don't want any Arab to live under us, they would have said, oh, you're racist. This is apartheid. But with the Arabs, it's okay. I'm talking about the whole world. I'm talking about the democratic countries. How can they accept a thing like that? But I see one Arab state and one Jewish state which has 1.5 million Arabs who today call themselves Palestinians. So where is the two-state solution? I don't see a Jewish state and an Arab state. I see an Arab state. And I see some, a state which is, you have intermingled Arabs with Jews. Maybe there is one state solution. Not two state solution. The one state solution is based on the following. Jordan has 85% of its citizens that are Palestinians. Jordan is not Hashemite. It's Palestinian. And maybe it will take another generation or maybe two generations and it will turn out to be Palestinian. Gaza is already Palestinian. The West Bank is going to be Palestinian. So what's left? It left the Jewish state where the Jews are 77% already. Now I'll tell you what the Israeli Arabs are doing. And as I said, the Arabs have a very large back, backing. They have Iran on the one side and the Turks on the other. The Turks and the Iranians are not Arabs, but they are Muslims. They are Muslim countries, and they are working on annihilation of Israel. Then you have the Arab nations, and then you have the Palestinians, and then you have the Israeli Arabs. The Israeli Arabs are the most dangerous. Why is that? Because they have the vote. They form now 10%, almost 10% of the Knesset. When they become 15, 20%, they may change the whole concept of the Jewish state. They don't have to be 51%. It's enough if they are 20%. Or even less. And I'll tell you why. Today, the right and the left are quite balanced. So, if somebody wants to become a prime minister and to form a government, he needs the Arab vote. That's why the left is, is going after the Arabs. And promising all sorts of promises. Now, supposing... In Israel, a government cannot be formed without the Arab vote. Then the Arabs will say to somebody like Shimon Peres or somebody like uh, Yossi Sarid, if you want to become a prime minister, you need us. And if you need us, we need you. We'll make you a prime minister. But abolish the law of return. Or apply it to the Arabs too. 
And there you have the Arabs, the influx of Arabs into the Jewish state. Or otherwise, there will be no law of return. And I can assure you there will be many people who would try to convince us that this is the best solution. So, we should think ahead. Now, I have gone into research of the Arab intelligentsia manifest. What are they thinking about? What are they planning for the future? And there is uh, an organization that includes all the intelligent Arabs and includes also the local government, the Arab local government, all these cities and institutions who are Arab. What they are trying to do is to be, to have a national entity within Israel. In other words, they want to be a state within a state, or they want to control the Jewish state. And I can tell you from one of the manifests, it says thus, We, the Palestinian Arabs, living in Israel, natives of the land, and citizens of Israel, are part of the wider Arab nation and Arab culture, and part of the greater Islamic people. Not a word about living, living in Israel, but not a word about the Jews or the majority. Then they say, Israel is the outcome of a colonialist act initiated by the Jews of East Europe and back it, backed by colonial states. Their demand is for Israel to re recognize its responsibility for the Nakba and pay compensation to the victims. So they are working now on nationhood within Israel. In other words, they want to turn Israel into a, a state, not a Jewish state, but a state of all its citizens. And you will be surprised that there are some Jews who back that, who support that. Not only support, but they help them to do that. And I can tell you that uh, I was a senior lecturer in Tel Aviv University for many years. Out of ideology, I went to Ariel, which is a small, little university, hardly 30 years old. We started in 1982 in Barkan, somewhere near, and we moved to Ariel, and now we have 12,000 students. Some of them are Palestinians from East Jerusalem. And we have all the faculties that exist, almost all. And you will find that some of the academics in Tel Aviv University or in the University of Jerusalem, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, want the end of this university. They even came to demonstrate against the university. They go abroad and they say, boycott a real university. In uh, seminars, and conferences that I attend abroad, I have no problem with the Arabs. I can prove that they are wrong in any discussion. I have a problem with my colleagues from the University of Tel Aviv and from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. There lies the main problem. I was at a conference in Cordova some years ago. And the discussion was about the freedom of access to the holy places. 
And there was a Palestinian called Ziad Abu Ziyad from a village just outside Jerusalem. And I said, when I was a little boy, I used to go and climb a house in Jerusalem to see the old city. Because I couldn't go to the Wailing Wall. I couldn't go to those places which are holy to the Jews. Now every Arab, every Jew, every uh, Christian can have as freedom of access to all these places. And then he said, Ziyad Abu Ziyad interfered and said, you're lying. You know I live in Azaria and I can't, I can't get to the waiting wall. I, so I can't get to the Mount Temple, to the Mizgat al-Aqsa. And I said, what are you talking about? Last Friday, there were 50,000 Arabs praying on Mount Temple. And he said, yes, they infiltrated through the Israeli Defense Forces. I said, 50,000 infiltrated? What do you think, the Israeli forces are blind? He said, yes. You know who shook their heads in consent? My colleagues from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv University. And when they shook their heads, they looked at me as if I was talking nonsense. So my problem is not with the uh, uh, discussions with the Arabs, but with the, uh, some of my friends who think that Israel should be, should be the end of it. And I think that as long as we do not accept the fact that the Oslo Agreement was a mistake and we should take a different path to stop appeasing the Arabs, but a more offensive path. And when I mean offensive, I mean mainly diplomatic and political offensive way. To initiate acts that are important for the existence of Israel. What I think should be done is much more Hasbara than Israel is doing. You know the budget of Israel is $100 billion a year. Do you know how much Israel gives for the Hasbara a year? $10 million, out of which $6 million go on salaries. This is not even one per mile of the budget of Israel. And the Arabs put all their efforts, all their money, and look what they've achieved. Israel now is a country that nobody wants to have anything to do with it. Because in all UN institutions, in the press, They've given so much money to uh, bring shame on Israel. This anti-Semitism has now flourished. It reminds me of the 1938 years. Just two weeks ago, a colleague of mine in uh, Ariel University, who was supposed to participate in a conference in Germany, got a letter saying, your university is illegal and you are in an occupied territory and therefore you cannot participate in the conference. When I saw this he sent it to me, and I saw that. I was thinking in what way one should uh, tackle such a thing. And in the end, I wrote him a very strong letter. 
And I thought that this letter not only will not uh, make him participate, but maybe uh, will be uh, will cause that uh, Israelis would not be able to go to such conferences. But you'll be surprised that after that, he wrote a letter and said, we made a mistake. We apologize. We think that education should not be involved with politics, and therefore we'll be happy to, get to, to uh, have you back. Now, what I wrote to them was that it's outrageous that a German institution in a German university in a German, on German soil is trying to preach to the Jews what illegality occupation means. And I said that Israel was the only country who offered the Palestinians a state. So where did we occupy? From whom did we occupy the land? At the most you can say it's disputed land. But if you go to the internet, to Wikipedia, you will find that in the world there are dozens and dozens of dis disputed lands. So you're not going to get students and lecturers and professors from those places? Why Israel? And it worked, but not, on, not always it works. So, Israel must take the precautions, and I think the Jewish people has, have a great task in fighting this anti-Semitism, the new anti-Semitism. And I see uh, problems ahead with the United Nations approval of Palestine. Because once there is an approval, and I hope that Obama would put the veto vote. By the way, the veto vote is not given for, for free. The veto vote is in, in, uh, in contrast with the uh, ability of Netanyahu to say that if a Palestinian state is established, then we are going to annul the Oslo Agreement. But on the whole, if there is a veto, still there is a recognition in the General Assembly, which will cause a lot of trouble because, first of all, you have demonstrations in the West Bank, and there are many Jews living in the West Bank. There are 300,000 Jews in the West Bank, and there is a great demand for more and more houses. You can see that the more they try to suppress uh, living in the West Bank, the more the Jewish people respond in making more houses. But there will be demonstrations and they will start attacking in the United Nations institutions as well as in the court in The Hague. But if we stand firm, we'll make it. And ladies and gentlemen, what you're doing for Israel is very, very much appreciated. And I want to thank you.